trade can essentially narrow down the boundaries while there's one thought which will say that well societies are what they are and while trade is there has to be some minimal level of or some optimal level of international collaboration but then the trade cannot solve for other problems which could not be economic in nature so the fact that today some countries operate in a low tariff regime it doesn't mean that they were always operating in a low tariff regime uh, they they first became richer by erecting tariffs by actually protecting their nascent industries by having a very vigorous industrial policy which supported an export growth through industrial policy and once that was done uh, you know they started advocating to the rest of the world that you know the tariffs are not good you should reduce your tariffs uh, having a strong exports kind of a story is critical for any kind of a future growth i think that is that much is very clear and uh, it's almost like a sign up one on and of the uh, you know the, the the future growth potential so both on the goods and the services side and the manufacturing story is uh, getting getting unveiled or other are rejuvenated in india again for different reasons it's it's a very strong story because uh, all center in india always had great capabilities in manufacturing even with all the constraints of colonialism and you know we, we did a lot of things at a reasonably good level of competence namaste and welcome to the bharat vartha podcast we have an old friend of bharat vartha with us today ashish chandorkar joins us from geneva ashish as some of you know works with the government of india in uh, geneva at the indian mission to the world trade organization uh, he is incidentally the first private person to be appointed at the mission uh, before that he had a very successful corporate career of over two decades in management consulting uh, in this episode we'll focus on global trade and exports uh, why it's important for a country and how india can gain a competitive advantage in the years to come through some strategic initiatives uh, so further without further ado uh, welcome to bharat vartha ashish uh, so glad to have you back thank you kari uh, good to be back and i must say that i speak here in my own personal capacity but uh, great to be back on uh, your show awesome awesome so ashish we have a lot of ground to cover and i will ask you a lot of annoying uh, slightly annoying let me put it that way 101 questions on trade and exports and you know how uh, these things matter to a country uh, so please bear with me and be, please bear with some of our novice listeners as well it might seem obvious for people that you know why trade is important right uh, we're able to exchange goods and services efficiently with other countries and you know also focus on our intrinsic strengths you know before we delve into some of the technicalities i'd love to hear from your perspective on how trade impacts economy and why it is important for a country so uh, trade has always been a key lever for economic growth uh, historically also if you go back you know several millennia or several let's say centuries rather uh, you would see that the exchange of goods was always the the founding principle of movement of people right like when people move move from one part of the world to another it was largely driven by these commercial interests while of course in, in the modern times if you look at the gdp calculations when when we say gdp of a country that includes the consumer side the investment side the government side and then you say net of exports minus imports i mean imports are kind of built in into the consumer investment and the government uh, side so essentially exports then becomes one of the factors of your gdp growth or the gdp driver the the very obvious benefit is that when a country exports you earn foreign exchange so that becomes yet another driver of let's say macroeconomic stability for the country like like we know in modern economies no one uh, country can produce everything that what it wants to consume so some trade is also essentially just inevitable even if a, a country did not like the idea of trade obviously that's not practical because things which you need for your economy or for your population you may have to anyway get it from somewhere else so there are various factors in which in why the trade kind of you know uh, has been growing and why it has been an integral part of any economic discussion or any economic growth uh, projection uh, even now if you see when people say that okay some country will do well or even if you look at the more modern history post world war 2 history several of the countries which have become prosperous and exports have played a very key part in their prosperity uh, each country of course adopts growth strategy which is contextual to their economy or their conditions or their population but uh, certainly several countries have used trade as a lever post world war 2 to gain foothold in markets more prosperous countries and uh, lifted several con- several people in their own country in their own society out of poverty created new skill sets sometimes through through trade and as a trade i mean it's both goods and services so you need constant upgrade of of skill sets to keep matching what's happening not just in your country but in other countries only then you stay competitive so yeah these are like the uh, let's say the overview of why trade is important for any uh, economy and would continue to do so in in the, in the future as well right i think post covid one of the aspects that you know uh, we've seen is that trade is also a great geopolitical leverage as well right i mean with so many of these implications and so on you know at present when we look at india we're not known particularly as an exporting country but we have a very rich history in terms of trade linkages and so on right uh, we exported silk cotton sugar 
precious stones to Greece, Rome, many other places. Could you describe this uh, rich history and legacy of trade in India? Yeah. Um... So it's kind of ironical that uh, we lost the edge on the whole idea of trade uh, in in the during the colonial era. But if you see, you know, going back a few centuries, when you say that when you when you see that Indian culture is similar to culture in other parts of say Asia and say in Southeast Asia or or even Far East, or there are Indian coins or Indian artifacts being discovered in the Gulf, or there are ancient texts written by the Romans and the Greeks which mention India. So the reason is very obvious that uh, India was a very key destination for global trade even in ancient times. People used to come here for in search of in those days spices and the raw materials basically some finished goods as well probably jewelry and carpets i mean those kind of artifacts when people got equipped when societies got equipped to make them these became an attraction of, of exports over the over the centuries so as such uh, india has had a great let's say history of of trade and of people moving and which is why even now it's it's true by the way world over that there are several cities even in Europe, which were halting points, which were like staging areas for traders to, you know, stay overnight or, or spend a few days. Or, or these were like market cities where people would converge from, traders would converge from various parts of the world for a few days or few months to sell what they had and then they go back to their respective countries. So even in India, there are there, there were always well-defined trading paths, the routes from north to south or north to the eastern part of the country. These are very well-defined even in India over, over the centuries. What happened was... A very familiar story, which is that when the industrialization uh, knocked on world's doorsteps, at that time, India was not industrializing at the same pace at uh, was what, what Europe was or what the Western countries were. So slowly, the advantage of making finished finish goods, then that kind of disappeared. I mean, India did not mechanize uh, in, in, say, 18th century and, and later as much as other countries did. So that would mean that over time, the whole manufacturing shift happened first in Europe and then in the US and then then in other parts of Asia. So we didn't really uh, fully leverage our past history of trade into the more modern times, which would need processing of goods and not just trading either handmade goods or, or raw materials. So that then, of course, there was a bit of a blip and then because of the colonial history where India became the destination to just export out raw material, especially cotton, which made the British mills prosperous over the years and then agricultural commodities in general. So I think that we, we kind of flattened out. I mean, we never really... Uh, participated in the in the global trade to growth in the more modern in the last two centuries and uh, that of course then creates a baggage when uh, post independence that that baggage was always there so it's a bit of a restart that you to start thinking as to what is your strength and where do you want to invest in and what kind of markets could you be competitive in by the time the world has gone ahead by let's say a century and a half so a fairly big distance to cover but as we know some of the asian economies have covered that distance in certain commodity areas or in certain groups so it's not that it cannot be done it's just that you start with a handicap so what you what was supposed to be a very uh, innate part or an innate feature of your society maybe you know even even as say 500 years ago that has now been lost since then for for different reasons for mainly for geopolitical and colonial reasons today if you see india would be maybe 12 13 maybe top 12 global exporters i need to check the exact data for each each country but so we have kind of come back a little bit i mean i'm talking about last year's data 2021 20, 22 so we've come back a little bit from the fact that we've created some positioning for ourselves especially in services and parts of manufacturing are now looking up but it's still there's a huge upside and since the culture was always there i mean you know trading as a as a profession has been a very key profession at least in domestic context. So there's no reason why it cannot be extended into a more international arena as such. So it's a, it's a matter of crawling back that space and then finding the niche in which we can do well. Yeah, I mean, uh, recently on our Independence Day episodes, we've been talking about the baseline that we had to start the modern republic with, right? Uh, uh, and uh, this is post about 200 years of uh, colonialism and then the conquest and whatnot. Shashi Tharoor makes that point eminently well, right? That uh, a lot of the industrial revolution in the West was funded by the raw material and the resources uh, from India and other parts. You know, interestingly, we had uh, Professor Rashmini Koparkar of a while back and she was talking about India and the Central Asian republics and how, uh, right, so so those old linkages are still sort of uh, omnipresent in some of these places across the world. Yeah, uh, exactly. And also, 
uh, it, it also depends on individual countries, how they preserve that. Some, some countries which are generally more trade focused. I mean, let's, let's take the example of the Western countries, for example, right? So these are, there are countries who have in the past, you know, used trade uh, for their other national ambitions. Like, like we discussed the, the colonial rule. Now, practically every country in Europe has had colonies in, in Asia and Africa. And so the trade fueled that geopolitics, right? In many cases, the, the search for raw materials, the search for the drivers of the growth drivers of the economy goods to be produced. The, the, the search for those raw materials became more of a it was no longer a commercial discussion. It became a more strategic geopolitical discussion for several of these countries. Similarly, even if you look at US, a more modern country, I mean, they've had their trade interests very well protected through their political and military uh, operations over the years. So in, in that sense, even in terms of the nation building, trade has uh, really shaped the, the modern world in far deeper ways than people kind of think about it because uh, the, the way we see the world today, in many cases, how the boundaries are drawn on the on, on, on the ground, that's just driven by the trade interests uh, purely, right? And in, in, in several parts of the world uh, where, where countries just divide, uh, discuss or discuss among themselves and then basically said, that, okay, you know, I will control this territory and you control that territory and so on. So, I mean, that the, the modern population still bears the, let's say, the after effects of those discussions which happened perhaps a century or two ago. And uh, in that sense, I mean, of course, uh, as you said, post-COVID world, several countries have started to look at trade differently uh, in, in terms of uh, a more, let's say, a national, if not security, then at least a topic of national interest or uh, issue of national interest. So yeah, I think there are these phases which in, in which things evolve and how the drivers of globalization, deglobalization evolve. Right. Um, so when we cut to the modern world, right? Uh, could you give us a lay of the land in terms of uh, how is trade governed around the world? So what happens is every time there's a big, let's say, event, geopolitical event, uh, that leads to a certain reorganization of the how the world is governed or self-governed. So if you see post-World War I, we had the League of Nations come up and they, there was some kind of an attempt to put an international order, world order in place, uh, like a rules-based world order, you can call it, or some, some kind of an international cooperation to discuss issues which were of mutual concern. Countries shouldn't act unilaterally. Similarly, that, that shift became much more prominent after the World War II, where the whole formation of institutions which then became IMF, World Bank and so on. So like there was a, a phase where these international institutions were created to support the reconstruction of the world in, in the in the post-World War II era. So one such institution which came into play uh, along with UN, IMF, World Bank, etc. was also what was called the GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. This went live in 1948 early 1940, 1st Jan 1948, if I, if I remember correctly. So this was the, uh, uh, this was modeled more like a financial institution and not like a, it, it's not not like a UN institution. It was less political in nature. It was more about economics and uh, exchange of goods in, in that era. And uh, of course, India was a founding member of GATT uh, soon after the independence, because I think there were 23 countries which were the founding members and India being one of them. So that GATT was the one which started really defining how the trade rules work around the world and uh, a fairly elaborate agreement was signed i mean covering a whole covering a fair, fair bit of ground and actually mo most of what was signed then we still use today with, with some additions which happened much later but uh, so so it was a fairly visionary kind of a structure in terms of what uh, should be the underpinning infrastructure or the global infrastructure of, of trade as such. By mid 50s, some of the developing countries realized that GATT was not necessarily helping them the way it was supposed to. So they became much, let's say, louder and much more vocal about their rights or their participation in, in the global trade, which then by mid 60s led, uh, you know, that resulted in some kind of uh, a structure of uh, special treatment being given to countries which needed that support. Like, so they, would, they should have less obligation relative to the more developed members in, in the world. So thus the the, the idea of how trade should be, what rules should apply, this kept evolving. Then, of course, there was the uh, formation of the World Trade Organization. So one, there were several drawbacks of GATT that it was looking largely on goods, services was not covered, the issue of intellectual property was not covered, the, the dispute resolution when there was a dispute between two countries, there, it was probably not found the most adequate the way it was handled in, in the GATT times. So then there was a, a round of discussion starting 1986, which was called the Uruguay Round, which lasted for eight years. And that Uruguay Round then led to the formation of what is now called the World Trade Organization, which is headquartered in Geneva. It, it uses 
almost everything which was there in GAT. Plus it adds the more newer dimension of what then the world was seeing, which was the services trade, the aspect of the development, the aspect of intellectual intellectual property and the whole dispute settle, settlement, dispute resolution mechanism, which was put in place. I mean, through, through, through a formal treaty between countries. So this is a legally binding kind of an uh, obligation internationally, which then the WTO imposes both in terms of the agreement. And when I say agreement, it is actually a series of agreements. There are multiple agreements uh, which, which are there. So the old GATT rules was then were then qualified further by through, through very specific agreements like agriculture and technical barriers to trade and market access, import licensing. So various forms of various aspects of trade uh, dynamic became codified into these agreements, which became collectively the World Trade Organization. That is a structure which continues, and of course the number of free trade agreements and the I mean, sorry, the the regional trade agreements have increased uh, since then, but. The, the crux of, of the world trade still remains WTO, which works on what is called the most favored nation principle, which is to say that you treat everyone else, all the signatories are treated as a most favored nation. I mean, the, the, the term evokes a lot of emotion, but it is a fairly simplistic term to say that, you know, give the same treatment to all other countries as you would do to you, the companies of your country, which is a national treatment. And there's no distinction between the, the trading partners. So those are the founding principles of, of the World Trade Organization. We'll get into the, you know, workings of uh, the WTO and maybe understand a little more in terms of how these negotiations and renegotiations happen uh, and that entire mechanism a little later in the conversation. But, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, we often hear from our libertarian friends that India should embrace free trade and that the fastest way to progress is through some kind of an unhindered market mechanism, efficiencies and so on, right? But when we look at countries which have free trade, free trade systems now, uh, what has led up to that? You know, what have they had to do to get to that point? Yeah, so this is a very interesting thing that a lot of the theorizing in the ideas that you read in the press, for example, happens in a very point in time fashion. So, for example, if something is working today, uh, there's a lot of advocacy for that to work uniformly for all countries or for, for everyone else as it is today. But no one really seems to, or very few people seem to look at the path dependence on how things got there. So the fact that today some countries operate in a low tariff regime. It doesn't mean that they were always operating in a low tariff regime. Uh, they, they first became richer by erecting tariffs, by actually protecting their nascent industries, by having a very vigorous industrial policy which supported an export growth through industrial policy. And once that was done, uh, you know, they started advocating to the rest of the world that, you know, the tariffs are not good, you should reduce your tariffs. I mean, that's the whole genesis of that and the WTO itself, that uh, some of the more developed members or more, more aware members of how trade can be used uh, to be fair, I mean, you can also say that, you know, they, they, they were ahead of their times in terms of foreseeing some of these things. So you can also give them credit and not just blame them for being a little hypocritical. But uh, in the sense that uh, these things were, I mean, practically every large uh, country has had some level of tariff applied uh, to, to, to develop the industry. And when the time is right, now the, of course, the question is that, you know, if, if you apply, a, if, you, if you erect a tariff and then would you then be able to answer the question that is the time right? Like when, when do you, when do you claw back? So that's more of a policy discussion I don't want to get into, but that, that's a fair question to ask as a, as a criticism. But to say that just because today, you know, 10 countries do not apply tariffs or have low tariffs, and hence everyone should have low tariffs. I think that belies the, the history of how those 10 countries got here in the first place. And uh, if, if you see the, the pre-recession US or even, even between recession and the formation of GATT, I mean, US itself had a fair amount of tariffs on, on a variety of products. Uh, the reason some of the Asian countries were late in terms of capturing US market was also related to the same point that, you know, the, the tariffs went away gradually. S similarly, it's also, by the way, not just tariffs. There is also the play of what is called the the, the non-tariff measures or the or the NTMs or non-tariff barriers. So if you see the analysis even today, most of the developed countries have a whole lot of non-tariff barriers which they put on on whatever they import, which means that they are uh, exposing or other they are other testing the imports to on certain standards or they could have certain rules which. Uh, which need to be fulfilled. There could be things like registration requirements, testing requirements, you pay a fee for something. So there are a lot of things which happen in the background, which has nothing to do with tariffs, but still make life miserable for someone who wants to export to these countries. That is never talked about uh, in, in, in the popular narrative. Like when, whenever a discussion happens about open economy, you will hear a lot about tariffs, but you don't hear as much about non-tariff barriers. Also because it is not it is not easy to understand in the, in the, in the first place, like, you know, that this is happening. So unless you are really clued in, uh, the tariff information is also available publicly, like each country 
company publishes that uh, each year uh, that that is collated by global organizations by world bank by wto by international trade center so a whole lot of con- organizations talk about tariffs but uh, or, or the information is collected but what you don't see is that there's a lot happening behind the scenes which has nothing to do with tariffs it's just the way the rules are applied and how that becomes a hindrance in itself in 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 some cases i think and unless this point is appreciated well enough some of the criticism which happens of trade policy i mean not just I mean, i'm not talking about just indian policy but i'm seeing the discourse globally on trade is far too dominated lopsided towards one one aspect which is a tariff but it doesn't really take into account the other parts of how how trade actually functions on the ground and i think that's a little bit of a let's a travesty because some of the most learned people also don't do that which is really is annoying sometimes that you know they really haven't thought through the fact that you know some country could have very different standards for you can restrict things in a in a very innovative way in some cases like like some countries have this concept of let me actually give you a couple of examples so like some countries have an exa- have a concept of private standards so the government will say that my let's say you want to import an electric fan so my standard is something you you define something but the industry which imports electric fans can say that okay my standard is you know this this plus xyz and that xyz is not really a national standard but all the importers will stick to that so legally you're not kind of barring anyone from sending electric fans at the base level of standardization but because no one is actually going to import unless you do three other things which which can then make your product uncompetitive so this this is very common in in several countries then there are what we call the non tariff barriers in terms of environment and issues of gender or labor laws so you can use the countries use these two as a protectionist measure which is fairly well known it's not that this is this is like new knowledge it's just that it is not really used when a uh, commentary is being made on some of these uh, topics in in when we do even in social media so basically tariffs are a blunt instrument right i mean uh, and there could be a finer nuances uh, uh, to achieving the same uh, objectives a more transparent instrument like you know that mm-hmm. there's a you know, this is a uh, if you send something to a, some country you basically have to pay a duty on it so so they are more transparent in the sense that but they are transparent if if if, if there was something which was non transparent and was converted into a tariff like when you convert a non tariff barrier into tariff it becomes more transparent but the problem is that it is not just tariff it is tariff plus some new non tariff barrier which has come into place in some other cases right so you probably try to become more transparent through this mechanism through international cooperation but over time the older regime has kind of propped up again in several countries uh, talking about other things i was going to make a point about uh, india in comparison to some of the asian countries right uh, you know when we look at it in perspective asia exports everything from you know uh, minerals to machinery to the world and accounts for about 40% of the international exports could you talk to us about you know how some of these asian countries uh, got really big on exports so if you see the more recently what were called the miracle economies of southeast asia and before that say japan korea and of course china in the more recent era they've all had a very export oriented uh, economy their national policies have supported that process in several ways they of course also had some level of import substitution happening especially in 1960s it was a very popular concept uh, in that times the import substitution was in a very pure import substitution which is which is to say that i would not take something from outside and i will just make it myself they used that concept in 1960s and some in several countries in several places to become internationally competitive we tried that as well but in that time we couldn't really pull up for different reasons uh, and i mean we, we couldn't really create any competencies specifically the ideas or or, or the, the 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 terms which are anathema today in some in, in discussions were all fairly widely and successfully used by other countries in a different context of course i'm not arguing that it's one to one correlation between 60s and this decade but the ideas were all there in in the past now even even in terms of supporting your companies for exports uh, giving them preferential credit making laws easier uh, having having let's say more lax labor laws i mean a lot of these factors have gone into uh, have come into play uh, or, or having agriculture subsidized so that you can start exporting your the excess production beyond what your economy needs so all these were very conscious choices made by countries it was not that this has happened accidentally this is all part of you know today people rail against subsidies but practically every country has done, achieved this through subsidies only which is that which is to essentially put in more and more money in identified areas and once you become competitive you want you don't want others to give subsidies so that's how the international routes work that once you have achieved a certain position you will say that no one else should achieve that you know because i am the incumbent so i will now protect my turf by saying that there should be an international rules based order which is which means the the next guy should follow start following the rules while i have already got to to, to a certain point so uh, that's been always uh, i mean that's how the the, the asian economy is also grouped uh, to their credit i mean some of them really did a good job in terms of becoming very good at and very competitive at things like auto and electronic components and uh, electronics so it's not just that i mean this doesn't happen naturally uh, you also have to very very consciously support it through an ecosystem of skills through education 
education, through training, through human capital, through uh, giving the right incentives which are designed for the industry. I mean, you can have general industrial policy, but you know, what does let's say an industry A needs versus industry B? So all of that, this was done by the East Asian countries and also uh, by by larger economies like China and uh, sorry Japan, Korea, and later on by China. You mentioned an interesting term there, uh, import substitution. Uh, and we heard about this a lot when the Atmanabhar Bharat was announced and, you know, uh, subsequently the profit link, profit linked incentives or PLIs and so on and so forth, right? I mean, in fact, many people argued that, you know, uh, some of these new measures were just basically import substitution, uh, you know, old wine in a new jar or new bottle and, 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 and stuff like that, right? Um, could you again explain import substitution in a very one-on-one way and uh, talk about how some of the newer measures are you know, slightly different from that? Sure. So the, way, the, the easiest way to, to understand the concept of import substitution is that, let's say I list out what I'm import. I select that, okay, I will not, you know, of, of the 10 things I import, I don't want five things to be imported because I may have the capability of making them at home. And I start, I basically put a ban to the imports and I start making them in-house or you put a gradual ban and you basically ramp up your domestic capability. So that would be typically a very blunt kind of way of thinking about import substitution. So PLIs, of course, are uh, what we are saying is that anyone, and when I say, of course, in classical import substitution, the idea was that the local companies make it. Uh, it's a domestic capability. So PLIs, of course, are not linked, uh, restricted to domestic companies. You know, international companies can also participate and are participating in those programs yeah. and you're getting incentives. So it's not really a one-to-one kind of a correspondence of how things were seen earlier or how the concept was seen earlier versus what's happening today it's it's a the idea is not i mean to, to restrict imports the idea is to essentially just create capabilities so these are two different objectives and given that foreign companies have really very enthusiastically participated it clearly means that they do see that dis- distinction even if the, the critics don't yeah i mean i uh, i also noticed that you know uh, in a lot of our defense procurement and everything there is added incentives to develop the ecosystem here right uh, uh, on similar lines in terms of like encouraging uh, you know uh, encouraging manufacturers whether here or abroad to sort of develop these and build capabilities in india right so so that is certainly like an objective but anyway let's get back to wto and the workings of the wto uh, could you help us understand the role of the World Trade Organization? You mentioned uh, uh, GATT, right? Uh, so give us a lay, you know, lay of the land, like a, from a very one-on-one perspective of all of these things. Yeah. Uh, so uh, WTO is a member-driven organization. Members are essentially uh, countries or groupings of countries or customs unions. So there are 164 members. There's some nuance. For example, EU has got a membership as well as the constituents of EU have also got separate memberships. As I said, customs unions can also become members of, of, of WTO. WTO with some conditionality, then there's a process of becoming a member. Uh, these members amongst themselves create rules which should govern the world trade. There's a highest body called the ministerial conference where all the trade ministers meet every few years. The most recent one happened in June in Geneva, just a couple of months back. And a lot of press coverage happened for that uh, in India as well. Under the ministerial, con- uh, you know, the body, there's a thing called general council, which is the highest apex body. Typically, all the ambassadors of each country to the WTO, then they attend that event or that, sorry, the forum. And uh, general council discusses the more policy direction and the administration of the organization and so on. And then there are specific bodies like Council for Trade and Goods, Services, Intellectual Property, several committees under these councils, which talk about specific topics. I mean, each committee or each council has its own agenda. Uh, members can also put things on agenda depending on what is relevant. And if there are any issues to be discussed or concerns which a member A has with member B, those can also be raised in these committees or councils. Uh, new rulemaking happens both top down and bottom up, meaning you can have an idea and you present it in general council and then basically work towards that. Or you can start something in a committee and then bubble it up once it becomes more mature into, into a general council or then later on to the ministerial. So uh, the, the unique part of WTO is that it is a member driven organization. So the secretariat, etc. I mean, the body, which the support body, which kind of runs the administrative side of the organization, they don't do things on their own. They do what members collectively guide them to do. So it's a little bit of a nuance via the, let's say some of the other international organizations where the secretariat itself or the, the international bureaucrats themselves can be fairly kind of powerful in terms of independent decision making. So there's a little bit of a nuance there in, in how this works. Each committee or each council meets two or three times, four times perhaps in a year, depending on the agenda and depending on the 
a number of things to be discussed. It has also got a trade monitoring function. So a lot of each, each member submits notifications to WTO, which are then monitored by these committees. So for example, if member A is submitting something, member B can study it and ask questions about it in committees as to this, this information is not tying up or can you provide more information about something else. So it's not just a trade negotiation, but also trade monitoring function, which happens. There's also the developmental aspect, which is to say that how do you support developing and the what's called the least developed countries. So how do you provide them more support into becoming better at trade? So there are several of these things which the organization collectively does. I mean, the members collectively do here in Geneva. Since it is very technical in nature and there are several of these committees, the, the best way for anyone who's interested would be to actually look through the WTO website, which is not easy to, let's say, navigate, but a lot of documents are available on, on the topic that, that, that you want to kind of read about. So it's it's pretty complex and people have a very simplistic idea of trade when they say, oh, import, export, cup business, right? So it's, it's actually fairly <laughs> complex underneath that in terms of the rule, rule making and, and how uh, things work. Yeah, I mean, the WTO website for sure, right? I mean, I can attest to it. Uh, before this uh, conversation, I was looking up a few reports and, you know, facts and whatnot. I mean, certainly not e easy to get your way around, uh, but it it's all there, right? I mean, like you mentioned, everything is there. What are some of the constraints that, you know, the WTO deals with, right? Because again, when you talk about international organization, whether it's the UN or UNSC and, and so on and so forth, I mean, these we see that usually the larger countries have a disproportionate amount of leverage and power in these, sorry, other international organizations. How does the WTO work in contrast to that? And also talk about some of the real world constraints that uh, WTO has to deal with. So uh, this organization has, it works on the principle of one member, one one vote, but voting is never really resorted to. Uh, most of the decisions or all the decisions are done by consensus. If there's no consensus, it waits to build a consensus over the years and which is why sometimes things take time to happen. I think one, one kind of defining feature is that there is no voting which really happens in WTO, uh, which is very different from a lot of the international organizations where things are just a headcount based process or some decisions are also made like that. So that doesn't happen in, in the WTO. I mean, there are, no, there are no veto powers per se in the sense that since everyone has got one vote, everyone can have a veto effectively, right? Like, you know, if you don't want to vote for something, that's like a in effect a veto. So it's not called that, uh, but uh, it's, it's a, in that sense, it's a much more egalitarian organization in terms of how the developed countries, the developing countries and the least developed countries are brought together. But that also means then it, it takes much more time to build agreement on something because even if members may agree on something on principle, but then the language, because these, this is by the way, a treaty organization so the, the the legality of it is very critical each country or each member then whatever is agreed in wto you, you then go back domestically and legislate for it domestically so hence the legality has to be like really watertight and one word i mean each word is debated and argued hotly like in the run up to the ministerial for example i saw that each declaration each word each paragraph it's debated endlessly as to, you know each comma each full stop so, so it's a very loyally organization like the lawyers have a very good time here in terms of uh, you know giving their input so uh, countries do have like several countries do. Uh, I mean, each each member actually has a set of legal experts involved in this process. So, so hence, sometimes people also blame the organization for to be slow that it's not doing enough or it's not uh, you know moving fast enough. So I think that's kind of the pros and cons of the way the structure is. But the structure really works because each member is you you, you could be a small economy, but you could be very active participant in let's say some forum which is of interest to you because you feel that your voice will be heard. So uh, I think that's like a very good feature with which I have seen that a lot of good inputs come from different members. There's a lot to learn, of course, because then since everyone has a voice, you also hear views of what's happening around the world on the same topic. So in that sense, the uh, information sessions which the WTO conducts, many of them are actually public in nature as well. So videos are available on the WTO YouTube channel. There's a lot to learn that way because a lot of voices are heard. It's not just the same 5, 10, 20, 25 countries talking. It's 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 a fairly broad segment of participation. Whatever you, whatever concerns the, the, a, a given member, each member may not talk about all the 100 topics, but you know, I, I think what, what really comes out is, is quite useful in terms of uh, learning from and even taking the ideas back into your own respective country. I think that's really the way it's designed for. The WTO YouTube channel is slightly better than the website, so I would encourage people to definitely check it out. So the WTO was founded in 95, right? 1995. And we're coming up on about three decades of uh, its existence. Uh, when you look at, you know, some of the objectives that they had, uh, perhaps you know, reduction in tariffs or making trade seamless and so on. You think some of these things have been achieved? I mean, what is the kind of report card that you would give to the WTO? So a lot of the objectives have, of course, been achieved in the sense that 
what was decided in the Uruguay round that was implemented in a treaty organization, which is a very difficult feat to achieve. So the fact that so many countries or members signed up for a legal kind of a treaty-based organization itself is an achievement. And then countries kept joining after that as well. And there are still several countries which are right now in the process of acceding or they are going through the, the defined process of accession. So in that sense, obviously, it makes a lot of sense for the, the international trade and the way it's governed. And now, like despite the fact that there are FTAs and regional agreements, uh, I think a substantial number, I'll have to check this number, but would be like two-thirds of the world trade could still be passing through the rules which are defined by WTO. So uh, in that sense, it's it's fairly relevant uh, in, in in terms of how it's uh, how it has envisaged the the world trade. Even the FTAs which are signed or or the regional agreements which are signed also ha- have roughly the same topic coverage. I mean they could they can they, they could address more topics, but they do address the rules which are addressed in WTO. So essentially, you know, it's they are, they are looking at WTO rules and then kind of adjusting them for the preferences which are coming up in a given setting, in a in a given regional or in a given bilateral setting. So in that sense, the work which has been done in WTO still forms the basis of any trade conversation conversation or any trade governance conversation. Uh, the, the criticism has been that rule making has not been very fast. But of course, then the other way to look at it is that WTO does other things in terms of trade monitoring and increasing the trade capacity of several members. Like you can see that exports to successes continue to happen. I mean, you know, several Asian countries continue to uh, gain from the participation in, in the global trade architecture. So in that sense, uh, I would say that on the balance, it's hard to argue that the, the system has worked well. Of course, any, any organization needs to change and evolve into what is relevant for the times. So that, that's a, that's an ongoing process. Some people argue that it has not happened as fast as that should have been. It's, it's, a, it's one of the viewpoints. But has the organization served its purpose? Yes, absolutely it has. Right. I think it forms a sort of an international template, right? I mean, that people or sorry, rather countries may emulate like bilaterally or multilaterally and so on. Uh, and understanding that, you know, consensus building is such a difficult thing, right? Uh, I can only imagine how complex it can be when it's, uh, you know, 100 plus countries uh, uh, and so on involved. Yeah, uh, see, Dean, one thing to note is that the WTO came into existence just like GATT was came into existence at one kind of a peak of globalization or rather the fact that a post-World War II order which was dominated by a few players so they could they could push an idea of a GATT-like structure. Similarly, I mean, world, uh, the World Trade Organization happened in, you know, in the, in the 90s which was the start of uh, probably the peak, uh, the, the highest peak of highest wave of globalization that we have seen so far in the in the human history. So, the, the timing also matters. Like what members agreed to in 94, 95, yeah. they may not agree today if it to start all over again because the concerns could be different. So yeah. the cycles of globalization, deglobalization continue to of course run and and uh, the, the organization can ride a cycle and ride a wave, which is which is fine. But but to, but the fact that it has weathered the storms which have happened, and at least in the last two decades, you could see several of those storms uh, in terms of the global economic crisis, like the you know, the, the dot com bust and the, the global financial crisis, and then COVID, and of course all the wars which keep happening. So despite a fairly active last two decades in terms of creating problems, the the org has kind of withstood from the point of view of a peak globalization into a world which is where there's a receding kind of a globalization. So I think that the timing is important. Like, let's we cannot forget the fact that a replication is not always easy because replication also depends on the larger context. In fact, you know, this reminds me of some of the work which you know Professor Dani Rodrik has done on the whole idea of what is the acceptable limit of globalization, right? So when when you say uh, you know what what control do you seed or when, when you globalize, like I mean, what are the trade offs involved for a society to globalize? So, so those debates have also been there. It's just that do these debates inform the functioning of any kind of a trade agreement or should they inform uh, the working? I think that's where the differences are in terms of the popular commentary. There's this much more of a purist thought which you would see coming out of the US mostly uh, and then think tanks in, in Europe that trade can essentially narrow down the boundaries while there's one thought which will say that well, societies are what they are and while trade is, there has to be some minimal level of or some optimal level of international collaboration but then the trade cannot solve for other problems which could not be economic in nature like political problems or social problems. So I think yeah, there are these pushes and pulls which you know the, the international system goes through. It's essentially subject to the uh, zeitgeist of the times, right? Basically, any of these organizations and so on. Could you give us some examples of countries that have benefited from signing up to uh, the WTO? So, you know, not not kind of getting into the kind of the how countries have used, but like one obvious example that comes to my mind is Vietnam. And I say that because of an Asian success, like the way they have become an export powerhouse, uh, they've done pretty well in terms of specific industries. The, the economy runs on, let's say, 
the the idea of exports and they have built a fair amount of domestic capability through that route which is quite commendable in the earlier times i mean of course japan and korea were those examples but then the society i mean the populations have kind of stagnated in terms of the size and societies have had other problems but i would say vietnam is a very interesting example to really study and see what they've done again there are nuances like how they've used the systems and so on but uh, certainly a lot to learn from from their success let's switch to india again uh, right when we look at india's position in global trade today i mean we saw that you know we had record exports in 2122 uh, for around 323 billion dollars coinciding with your stint at uh, geneva by the way but but still when you think about it i mean we're still 10th or 12th as you mentioned in terms of exports and uh, there's also a significant uh, difference in in terms of imports and exports that we have right uh, what is your position in terms of like where we are right now No, so I, let me actually not comment on uh, the the current policies. I think that would not be really apt for this discussion. But let's just say that things have, of course, looked up in the last couple of years. Uh, it has nothing to do with my appoint, appointment, which I should also <laughs> clarify. People ascribe wrong causality, or or I, I mean, I don't want to ascribe wrong causality here. But I mean, sometimes you can do it to do the mock, uh, which is a different thing. But uh, uh, the the fact is that things are, of course, looking up, and both on the goods and the services side. And let's hope that that momentum continues. You you would have seen some of the news. items uh, in the media in the last week where the minister has said that you know how the systems are being redesigned and revamped for a future path a future direction so a lot of stuff happening a lot of let's say decisions being made with some of which are in the public domain and that should be really looked into i, I think we'll all agree that uh, having a strong exports kind of a story is critical for any kind of a future growth i think that is that much is very clear and uh, it's almost like a sign up one on in terms of the uh, you know the, the the future growth potential so both on the goods and the services side and there's a lot of opportunity clearly that, that there's no doubt about that i mean policy wise i hope things uh, you know evolve in the right right in, in the way they they've been planned for and uh, yeah uh, hopefully we can have much more detailed discussions in future about that Yeah, one thing that uh, kind of stood out is how our services exports have grown, right? Uh, uh, in twenty one twenty two, we did over two fifty billion dollars, uh, right? And this is at a time when you know travel, hospitality, all of those things have come to a, a standstill or are are perhaps even more a little limited, right? Um, so another thing that we hear in the realm of exports and international trade is free trade agreements, right? Uh, we have FTAs with the uh, uh uae australia and now perhaps later in the year we'll have one with uk uh, how important are ftas as a tool for international trade so ftas have their own place the the question is that can you do everything through a mfn based system which is wto or most favored nation based system or do you want to do something which is more bilateral in nature which only applies to the signing parties because in wto what you sign applies to everyone like the same concessions or the same benefits are available to all the signatories while in an fta you may give specific benefits to the other side so uh, of course uh, ftas are done so that two countries can maximize the potential of the bilateral part of the trade so it is quite possible that any pair of two countries are have a very spe- specific trade relationship because of their economic structure that they they could be importing something specific from one country and then exporting to the world or exporting back to the same country so there are these considerations which may not generally apply but could very well apply in a in a very limited context uh, between between two two economies and that's how fta is assigned to essentially unlock the benefits of the the very near near term or very obvious synergies between between these countries so yeah as you as you know that we have signed an fta with uae the australia one is uh, also done it's pending the australian government ratification then there is uk and eu you know we are aware of in terms of the discussions going on so a lot so it's it's a it's a dual strategy like you you do what you do in wto but you also try and unlock value elsewhere uh, and that, that's i think the idea uh before we leave you ashish uh you know what are we optimistic for on the exports and the international trade uh, front from an indian perspective i mean i i am always optimistic in general uh, but uh, i i would say that the manufacturing story is uh, getting getting unveiled or other are rejuvenated in india again for different reasons it's it's a very strong story because uh, all center in india always had great capabilities in manufacturing even with all the constraints of colonialism and you know we, we did a lot of things at a reasonably good level of competence so it's there's no reason why some of that cannot be you know further revamped or we cannot no reason why we cannot become uh, very competitive globally in some of those aspects there are other 
supporting factors also which are kind of propelling that story today so if that happens and we become better at doing some of the things and of course that also in 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 turn becomes export oriented also like you first have to become good domestically and uh, create a certain quality and create a certain predict- predictability of output and and win the trust of consumers etc domestically and then that story can become international so that's like a natural progression the services again the fact that like as you said despite the the, the more contact intensive services not working uh, we were still able to do a lot of remote work and you know had a fairly good last last year at least there again the the services itself there's a value chain what we do you know can you do much more uh, in terms of the uh, complexity of what is being done remotely uh, which is what indian strength has been to to de- deliver things uh, remotely uh, there's a lot but of course the more complex the stuff the more regulatory nature of it also becomes get, gets more complex in the importing country so for example i mean if you were to export a game uh, uh, you know a game or a music cd out of i mean a music or song or a movie out of a country that's that would have a very low, low threshold of uh, you know being accepted in another country but if you were to say financial advice out of a country then that becomes more highly regulated environment right or there will be specific rules so as the complexity grows you have to also learn to deal with the regulatory nature of how things work in different countries so uh, we will hit, hit that very soon as as our own export complexity grows then also there's a lot more in terms of let's say opportunities could be that you know people are teaching uh, you know education not in a not necessarily just in an organized at tech sense but more of a individual contribution as well in terms of let's say you know good teachers teaching online uh, to kids elsewhere i mean you not be in the same in, i mean in your own own country but outside india uh, that is like a i mean it's already kind of playing out but uh, let's see how far that story goes and uh, without being getting very organized because all of them are just individual players so there was also the cap- the bandwidth capacity that you know one person can only do so much in terms of the time available but, i mean tourism remains uh, always remains a great opportunity i mean for us of course last couple of years that was a bit of a dampener but that that is always a great opportunity because there's so much to do and see in the country the organization of it and just the improvement of accessibility facilities around to the sites i mean that itself can be a huge let's say a uplift over the years by the way i mean like before the pandemic struck we had a fairly good one year of tourism a couple of years of tourism actually like you know our our highest monthly arrivals were actually in december 2019 so just before the pandemic so that that month was your highest foreign foreign tourist arrival ever in, in india and i think the year itself the calendar year itself was the highest number of foreign tourist arrivals so we had a fairly good year and then of course covid kind of put a stop to that so that again needs to be that that story will again kind of pick up you have you would have already see, also seen the announcement recently of programs like heal in in, in 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 india where we are saying that people can come to india for medical treatment recently was in news in the last few weeks so these are the type of ideas which will essentially play on our strength and hopefully then contribute to a growth in the in the in the times to come so, no just a couple of points to add in terms of you know manufacturing and services specifically because you know i do talk to startups uh, as well right and uh, uh manufacturing i think is such a low hanging fruit for us uh, i think productivity and pricing will improve I, I, by orders of magnitude i feel uh, right and as as the software dependency uh, grows right i mean in terms of automation and robotics and stuff i mean these are skills that we that we have i mean th- that is inherent in uh, you know uh, uh, in, in the country and we will be able to leverage that for uh, better things right for sure Uh, and on the services front um, yeah if you think that remote flatten the world i think vr and virtualization will again flatten it uh, by an order of magnitude and harsh makes the point uh, as well right harsh gupta our friend uh, makes that point in terms of how services will catapult uh, in the era of ar and vr so on all of these fronts i think we have a lot to look forward to uh, but thank you so much uh, for you know taking time off your busy schedule ashish and joining us on bharat varta uh it was a you know uh, as always a pleasure to talk to you and hopefully we can have you back periodically to and uh, you know uh, to talk to our uh, listeners thanks carry and good to be back and uh, yeah absolutely uh, can always have a conversation in a more general terms of on what's going on and and optimistic stuff about india i i just realized that we got through an entire conversation without mentioning poha so <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a time of the recording right day had it been a weekend it's it's would have been a little different but... <laughs> exactly oh you do, you do get your uh, uh, sunday morning or monday morning poha right in geneva oh, of course of course i mean i i took packets of poha which are st- which are still lasting it's been a year that i moved here but uh, it's still i'm like every time there's a movement to india like you know the poha gets replenished so <laughs> awesome all right ashish thank you so much Thanks good thanks Gary. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharatvarta podcast. 
If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharat Vartha to facilitate long form discussions on politics, policy and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharat Vartha on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care and jai.